Muy buenos días, bienvenidos a esta cuarta conferencia mundial de Relaciones Internacionales. Estamos muy contentos de haber podido llegar hasta aquí. Ha sido muchos meses de trabajo y estamos desde, desde hace mucho tiempo organizando esta actividad. El CERI es la organizadora, es una fundación que nació hace 18 años, ha crecido al ritmo de mucho trabajo de estudiantes, mucho trabajo de especialistas y siempre nos hemos conectado entre nosotros tratando de ver la política internacional con un punto de vista amplio, tratando de respetar las diferentes opiniones, sumando a, a todos quienes tengan la intención de conocerse, de explorar, de investigar y de hacer actividades que nos nutran. El hombre se descubre cuando se mide con un obstáculo, decía San Antoine de Superi, conocedor como pocos de los vaivenes de la naturaleza humana. Es frente al encuentro con la adversidad que terminamos de manifestar nuestras capacidades, nuestras fortalezas para levantarnos y hacer frente a aquellos que nos desafían. Es en el momento de crisis donde nos nutrimos de nuestra fuerza, nuestra creatividad y nuestra imaginación para encontrar las posibilidades y caminos que nos permitan resolver ese obstáculo. Bueno, sin duda la pandemia generada por el COVID nos ha planteado en este 2020 un obstáculo que por momentos pareciera difícil de afrontar. A las terribles pérdidas humanas, eh, sumados contagios que parecieran no terminar, inevitablemente se le añadió una crisis económica sin precedente, con mucha desigualdad mundial. Las respuestas estatales y globales, en muchos casos, aún no han podido encontrar soluciones que permitan abordar esas complejidades. Es en este estadio, en este medirse con un obstáculo, que la Cuarta Conferencia Mundial de Relaciones Internacionales, que estamos organizando desde el CERI, se plantea como un evento esencial para nuestro redescubrir. Pensada como un espacio plural de intercambio entre académicos, activistas, actores del sector privado, organizaciones no gubernamentales y policy makers, la conferencia nos invita a frenar frente a este obstáculo para reflexionar con imaginación y sobre nuestras capacidades y posibilidades. Desde el CERI confiamos en la necesidad del diálogo en este proceso, un diálogo que nos interpela, nos cuestiona y nos lleva directamente a pensar escenarios y salidas inclusivas que nos permitan explorar los laberintos de esta crisis. Durante estos cuatro días, la conferencia recorrerá temáticas diversas, desde economía hasta feminismo, pasando por el racismo, el medio ambiente, la seguridad internacional, la democracia, los movimientos sociales, entre muchos otros temas. Desde una mirada que entremezcla lo global y lo local con expertos provenientes de Asia, de África, de Europa y de toda América. La conferencia procura proveer visiones que faciliten el encuentro que debe ser enriquecedor para todos ustedes para construir pensando en el futuro. Creemos desde ser y que, frente a este obstáculo global que hablábamos, la respuesta ha de incluir necesariamente perspectivas globales que tengan en cuenta las realidades y necesidades situadas. El COVID se nos ha presentado este año como, como ese obstáculo que hablábamos eh, eh, y donde nosotros debemos descubrirnos juntos. En la intersección entre lo que está pasando y lo que puede venir es que está parada esta conferencia con la esperanza de tender, de, de tender puentes, abrir el diálogo y promover soluciones que nos permitan hacer frente a lo que hoy nos está desafiando. Así es. La fuerza del descubrimiento, además, está guiada siempre por los jóvenes. Aquellos que sin miedo se enfrentan al obstáculo con creatividad, frescura, soltura, que son necesarios para, re para reforzar todos estos debates que queremos dar. Esta conferencia tiene como base y pone como centro a la juventud. Primero, con un equipo de trabajo joven, con estudiantes y recién graduados, que han trabajado sin descanso durante los últimos meses en la organización de este evento. Después, con la presencia de más de 200 voluntarios de 10 países de América Latina que han contribuido a las definiciones académicas, a las actividades de difusión y han colaborado institucionalmente. 
y a partir de la participación de muchísimos jóvenes que nos han enviado sus trabajos académicos y van a estar exponiendo a lo largo de estos cuatro días trayendo nuevas ideas y consideraciones. Y finalmente, la preparación de la Agenda 2030, que incluye objetivos y propósitos que los jóvenes consideran necesarios abordar en las siguientes décadas para alcanzar un mundo más juntos. Es un honor para mí darles la bienvenida y agradecer la participación de más de 8.000 inscriptos. Ahora vamos a pasar a un pequeño video que cuenta un poco más en profundidad la historia y lo que es el ser y lo que representa. Los dejamos con el video. Muy buen día, seguimos arrancando con esta conferencia mundial de relaciones internacionales, esta cuarta conferencia mundial de relaciones internacionales que recién dimos la inauguración oficial y nos pone muy orgullosos de poder estar aquí, de haber organizado este evento, de poder estar junto a ustedes, de la cantidad de participantes de todo el mundo que están formando parte y vamos a arrancar con una con uno de los especialistas más importantes de lo que es la Academia de las Relaciones Internacionales y nos pone muy orgullosos que él esté aquí. Sí, efectivamente, estamos empezando con todo este cuarto Congreso Mundial de Relaciones Internacionales y en este caso vamos a estar hablando de un tema sumamente relevante y actual, racismo y relaciones internacionales. Y vamos a tener a un importante, un muy destacado teórico británico de las relaciones internacionales, moderado también por un amigo de la casa que seguramente, bueno, podrá ser una, una moderación muy, muy pertinente, ¿no? Sí, contamos con Federico Merque, que es eh, licenciado en Relaciones Internacionales de la Universidad de El Salvador, doctor en Ciencias Sociales por la Universidad Flaxo, también es profesor a tiempo completo en el Departamento de Ciencias Sociales y, de la, y director de la carrera de Ciencias Políticas y Relaciones Internacionales de la Universidad de San Andrés, y también es investigador del CONICET. Eh, y hasta el año 2009 fue coordinador del, eh, coordinador del Consejo Argentino para las Relaciones Internacionales y profesor de Relaciones Internacionales en la Universidad de El Salvador. Así que, Federico, te dejamos con el, con el profesor Busan y el panel es tuyo. Bueno, muchas gracias Mariano y equipo por esta introducción, un placer estar acá. Now we shift to, to English to welcome Professor Barry Busan. Um, I'm sure you all know him about his uh, very long and intense uh, exercise of IR discipline in, in Britain. Professor Barry Busan is a is emeritus professor of, of IR at London School of Economics. He's also honorary professor at Copenhagen, Schilling, and China Foreign Affairs University. 
and he's also a senior fellow at London School of Economic Ideas, uh, a sort of think tank to think about international politics, and a fellow of the British uh, Academy. Uh, Professor Busan has written, co-authored, or edited over 25 books, written or co-authored nearly 150 articles and chapters. Um, and he has done a tremendous job in reconvening the English school as a, as a scholarly uh, program and make it known to a wider audience as well. Um, he also has made an outstanding contribution to our understanding of international and regional security, both in theoretical and empirical ways. And more recently, he has produced very, very interesting articles and, and pieces on China's rise and on the 19th century as a foundational period of our international society. Today, Professor Busan will give a, a presentation on a very, uh, on a very interesting topic, on a very uh, current discussion, which is uh, the connection between race, racism, and international relations. He will give a presentation uh, of about 40, 45 minutes, and then we will uh, move to some uh, Q&A session. So, Professor Busan, an honor to be here with you, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Federico. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, as you say, this is a very uh, controversial topic, racism and international relations theory, um, quite contemporary. Uh, this talk comes out of work that I've been doing with George Lawson and with Amitabh Acharya over the, the last years. Um, the definition of racism I'm going to use here goes uh, like this. So I'm going to understand racism as the belief that the division of humankind into distinguishable biological groups by race can and should be used to establish social and political hierarchies in which some races are treated as superior and others as inferior. I think that's a fairly um, encompassing uh, definition. What I'm going to do in this talk is look first at some of the difficulties of applying this concept, um, and then I'm going to look at its place in the discipline of international relations in two phases. A first phase starting in the 19th century, uh, going up to 1945, and the second phase, uh, 1945, to, to where we are now. So to start with the, the difficulties in applying uh, the concept, uh, well, perhaps the most obvious one um, is that this is now an extremely highly charged political and social issue, right? So not to put too fine a point on it, uh, you're damned if you talk about it and you're damned if you don't. Um, it is very easy to go wrong uh, in this issue. Matter movement and other similar are very much in the public domain at the moment, um, sensitizing this for, for all manner of good reasons. But there are awkwardnesses in that as well. Uh, might be wondering what I'm doing talking about this as a white guy. Right? Some of you, and, and he is an old white guy, some of you might think that inappropriate. Uh, that is the kind of nature of, of, of the charged times we are in. So that's one difficulty. Um, and I'm happy to talk about that aspect or any, indeed any of this in the Q&A afterwards. The second difficulty um, is that racism as I've defined it covers an enormous range of behaviors. Um, so all kinds of things can fall within uh, the boundaries of a definition like the, the one I gave. One way to understand this is to see it as a kind of spectrum. Right? So on one end of the spectrum, there's a very explicit, personal, in-your-face, strongly held kind of racism from one person to another, as it were, of the kind you would associate with a, or a part clan or any other kind of, uh, of active uh, racist group. At the other end of the spectrum, um, there is a racism which is implicit. Uh, the term structural for this is, is in fact uh, at the moment. That may indeed be outside the awareness of the person uh, who is being accused of it or whose work is being accused of it. Um, a good example of this, and I'll come back to this thread, is uh, 
the idea that international relations uh, in general uh, and, and international relations theory in particular is Eurocentric. Right? It's a kind of umbrella idea, uh, and there's a lot of truth in it, and there's an element of racism in that, sort of woven through with, with a lot of other things, which makes it uh, quite complicated. And this is a bit of a difficulty, but I'd like you to keep this frame of reference in mind of these two extreme ends of the spectrum, because it applies very much to IR uh, as we go along. A third set of difficulties, which relates to and amplifies this, uh, this complexity, um, is that racism has complex and often close linkages with a variety of other concepts. Right? Um, it is often linked to nationalism, even though nationalism and racism have quite different origins. Nationalism in principle can be about equality, the whole. Another of the, uh, the linkages uh, that racism has is with cultural and religious differences. Right? So most high civilizations in history have shared the trope of civilized versus barbarian. Now, that trope can be understood in all kinds of ways. Uh, it might be cultural difference, uh, as it was, for example, mostly in China, or it might be religious difference, um, or it might be racism, and it might be very difficult to disentangle these things. Uh, you can see a modern version of that uh, in some of the contemporary politics and debates around migration, uh, which is, uh, is the concern about migrants a cultural one or a religious one or a racial one? It can be very difficult to disentangle those things, and it might indeed be all of them uh, together. Uh, muddies the waters when you're trying to talk uh, or... Uh, what's racist and, and another of the linkages uh, that racism has is with slavery and this is an interesting one um, again one I'm happy to talk about in the Q&A um, in these times we very much see especially in the West uh, we very much see racism um, through the lens uh, of slavery particularly uh, European and American slavery and and as that resulted in uh, lots of africans being taken over to the uh, to the americans this is a very um, powerful link which very much uh, uh, affects the way people understand uh, racism but there is no uh, uh, that link between slavery and racism is a relatively new one um, that if you look back at the history of slavery uh, there's not much link with race or racism at all. Anybody could become a slave through most of the thousands of years of, of human history in which slavery was an acceptable institution. Elaborate on that in the Q&A if you want. Same we said of, of, of empire, that in, uh, in the 19th century there was quite a strong linkage between empire and racism, but that was not historic linkage. Uh, most empires were not founded uh, on any kind of idea of racism. There's also an interesting uh, link uh, with between racism and the idea of patriarchy. There are some feminist authors who argue quite convincingly that uh, in some senses, uh, racism and indeed uh, slavery um, are consequences of the fact that uh, the uh, society learned how to divide itself up and have one group in society subjugate um, another, uh, and that women were the first group to be subjugated in that way. And basically, um, slavery and racism were things that, uh, in a sense, reduced others um, to the status that women had already been reduced to. Now, all of that um, points to racism as part of a wider institution of human inequality. And I think this is a helpful way of thinking about and beginning to untangle some of, of So the broad idea would be that um, up until 1945, human inequality was broadly legitimate. Um, and, and indeed widely and deeply practiced in most uh, cultures and civilizations of the world. Um, and that this inequality could take 
many forms. Right? It could take the form of patriarchy, it takes the form of slavery, um, or imperialism, or racism, or, or uh, class, or caste. There are all manners of ways, uh, uh, some of them overlapping, um, in which inequality could be, uh, uh, could be pursued. And there was, up until there was a human rights uh, um, to mediate this. Human inequality was the accepted institution pretty much up till 1945. Um, an appalling apotheosis in uh, in the Nazi regime. Now, since 1945, uh, these kinds and forms of human inequality have become uh, legitimate, much less legitimate, um, and much less widely deeply practiced than they were before. So, since 1945. Um, human rights and, if you like, broadly a principle of human equality has become uh, the new norm. So there is a very big watershed here. And so I'm thinking here in somewhat English school terms um, uh, that before 1940, human inequality was an institution of international society. And post-1945, that got replaced with a new norm not necessarily a perfect set of practices, far from it, but a new norm um, in which human rights um, and human equality in particular um, were, uh, were the institutional. Now, one interesting thing about this is that in this perspective, racism is probably the most recent form um, of human inequality. It becomes particularly strong uh, in the 19th century. Uh, it's harder to find, not impossible to find before that, uh, but it's not a major feature of most societies uh, before that. So in some ways, um, modernity. Okay, so with that background, then, let me turn to uh, racism has played in international relations. As I said, we're going to look at this um, in two periods. So, uh, let me start with uh, from the 19th century up until 1945. Now, here you have to uh, bear with me. Uh, those of you who've absorbed a history of the discipline of international relations in which it's supposed to have started in 1919 will have to temporarily th throw that idea uh, out the window uh, because I'm going to argue that uh, there was, in a sense, international relations before international relations. So if you look at the 19th century, this is when most of the major areas of international relations theory were, were developed. Um, this includes realism, um, uh, German realism in the 19th century, liberalism in the 19th century, um, international law and the idea, uh, or positive international law and the idea of international society, uh, very much 19th century. Strategic studies, uh, Mahan, Clausewitz and all that, 19th century. Geopolitics, very, uh, very big in the 19th century. Marxism. Uh, and the study of imperialism, also 19th century, international political economy, 19th century, study of international organizations, 19th century. So uh, there's a long kind of prehistory of international relations, uh, which leads up to its launching under the label of international relations in 1919. Now, the, the key point I want to make here is that, that this period, this century, if you like, between the middle of the 19th century and the middle of the 20th century, uh, during which international relations developed and, in, and emerged as a specific labeled academic discipline, coincided with the heyday of scientific racism. Right? This was when the practice of racism um, in world politics was at its strongest. Duncan Bell, um, in his 2013 book, puts this uh, about as bluntly uh, as it could be. He says, uh, and I quote, uh, for the opening decades of the 20th century, race was widely and explicitly considered a fundamental ontological unit of politics, perhaps the most fundamental of all. So this is the kind of intellectual and indeed political environment in which international relations uh, emerged. And it's not therefore surprising that race theory and race theory of the very at the, at the very kind of explicit personal in your face end of the uh, of, of the spectrum uh, was part of mainstream IR theory 
So if we look at, uh, say, uh, liberalism, um, <clears throat> there were ideas in liberalism that could be, could be and indeed were, linked to uh, racism. So a lot of liberals were, uh, were very happy with the notion of meritocracy, uh, and that could easily be fitted into an understanding of uh, a race hierarchy. Uh, likewise, a lot of liberals were perfectly okay with the idea of empire, uh, and that also could be fitted uh, into a race hierarchy. Realism and geopolitics, uh, sometimes notoriously, uh, could be made very compatible uh, with social Darwinism and, and often were. So uh, it was very easy to build racism into that kind of power political theorizing. Um, international law and international society were both um, infected with the idea of the standard of civilization, that law uh, and international society only applied to civilized people. And again, um, that was a framing that could easily be made uh, compatible with, with racism. Even Marxism um, had a pretty strong core periphery view of the world and a very progressive understanding of how it was that the world should uh, develop, uh, i.e. everybody should uh, uh, copy what was going on in, in the West. Um, and this also was a view of, it, of inequality that could be made perfectly comfortable with, uh, with racism. Um, and if you are sensitive to racism, it can be quite embarrassing to, to read uh, some of the classics in all of these literatures, uh, including Marx. Right. So during this, uh, this kind of first century, if you like, of, uh, of international relations, much of it was strongly imbued with a very explicit form of racism. And there was indeed some just outright uh, race theory, which said that the white race was the best one and the white race should take over and run the world and the rest of the races uh, should disappear in, uh, in, in some way. Um, it, it, if you go back and read this kind of literature, if your library has a lot of old, uh, old books in it, almost anything you pick up that was written before 1945 has what to a contemporary reader seems an astonishingly uh, racist perspective in it. A lot of the names um, associated with this have been forgotten. Nobody remembers Lothrop Stoddard or Charles Pearson or Paul Reinsch, although they were all well known um, in their day. Some of the geopolitics thinkers like uh, Nicholas Spickman and Halford Mackinder, Carl Haushofer, their names are a bit more remembered, uh, but they too uh, were pretty specifically racist in various elements of their thinking. Uh, I don't need to say much about the Nazis, everybody knows about, uh, about that. Uh, ditto Imperial Japan. Um, and the Kyoto School that supported it ha has uh, been accused with some justification of, of racism. There's a whole uh, literature now on Woodrow Wilson, who as an individual um, uh, was not, uh, not lacking in, uh, in racist thinking and, and racist politics. There's a lot of literature on this now, you can the works of or Tata Hobson and others uh, at this. So for this early period, then, racism was um, very explicit uh, and accepted uh, in much of IR theory uh, in this formative period of international relations. I think the key point I, I want to make is that except for the racially explicit theories, Racism was not necessary to the logic of any of these other mainstream theories. It wasn't necessary to the logic of liberalism or realism or, or geopolitics or Marxism uh, or, or uh, international society. It, you could do all of those theories without the race element. But when racism was fashionable, when it was uh, actually what was being practiced in international relations, then international relations theory had it built in in this way. Okay? Um, the, uh, there was, of course, anti-racism during this time, but it was mostly, um, in a sense, locked into, uh, into the periphery. Figures like Du Bois and Tagore and Sun Yat-sen um, and Nehru were all speaking out against the racism uh, of, uh, of the West, but they were largely in a marginalized position uh, within international relations the discipline at that time, uh, because this was uh, a pretty 
uh, West-centric, indeed Anglosphere-centric uh, uh, discipline. So uh, in the first period then, uh, there's no question that international relations theory was imbued with that. Okay, so let me pick up again. Then uh, if we move to the second period, uh, which is uh, since 1945, uh, we see a very sharp break. Um, and this is a, a two-part break. It's a, it's a break in the real world practice of international relations, and it's also a break in uh, international relations theory. Uh, Amit Avatari and I have seen this as a kind of second founding moment for the discipline in some ways. It becomes much more uh, American uh, in, in, in many ways. Uh, but for the purpose of this, uh, of this talk, uh, the, the place of racism, if you will, in, uh, in international relations theory shifts to the other end of the spectrum. Right? The explicit in-your-face uh, kind of racism largely and very quickly um, disappears, and it is replaced by an implicit structural Eurocentric, if you will, um, form of racism, which which has other words around it. Right. So some of the talk of development and underdevelopment, or weak states and strong states, uh, can be interpreted, as it were as replacing the racist language in IR, but having the same kind of function. So explicit racism is largely dropped and largely forgotten. Um, and it's not the only thing that's forgotten um, at this time. There was a feminist strand and IPE strands um, in interwar uh, IR theory that were also forgotten uh, after 1945. So that is are as having been um, uh, an embarrassment because of the, the explicit racism of, of quite a lot of it. So geopolitics didn't really come back for uh, another 50 years. But international relations, uh, the discipline follows the, the, uh, the world uh, in the Second World War. Okay. So, um, as I was just uh, saying, there was a sharp break um, in IR, uh, IR theory around uh, the end of the Second World War with a move towards um, the other end of the spectrum of racism where it's more structural, implicit, uh, and more associated with, with Eurocentrism. This organization um, with uh, the... Uh, uh, growth of, of human rights um, and uh, human equality uh, as the norm. Um, as with the onset of the Cold War, there were things other than racism to worry about, uh, namely nuclear weapons and ideological issues. Um, so most of the whole concern about racism as a day-to-day -day issue in, uh, in IR or as a way of theorizing um, simply disappeared. Uh, that uh, for most of us who were around at that time and uh, learning IR and studying IR, the main issue was uh, anti-apartheid in South Africa. Okay? And a little bit uh, of spillover of that into uh, the American domestic uh, uh, race politics. But that was really the only explicit manifestation of race concerns. Right? So IR largely moved away from all this, um, but arguably in doing so, it simply moved um, towards the more implicit structural uh, version of uh, racism that was embedded in Eurocentrism um, and in thinking about you know, first world, third world, uh, uh, and all of that. So the question is, how did this uh, how did racism get back onto the agenda of, of IR, given this kind of rather large transition? Uh, and here, I think um, uh, that the post-colonialists uh, deserve a lot of credit here. Post-colonialism was, uh, from the 1950s, attacking Orientalism and Eurocentrism, not just in international relations, but more broadly in the social sciences and, uh, and humanities. It, became much more conspicuous once the Cold War had ended after, after 1989, but it was around for some decades before that. 
Um, in a sense, you could see this as picking up um, the ongoing anti-colonial, anti-racist rhetoric uh, from, uh, from the global south. So post-colonialism uh, can be seen through two lenses. It can be seen through a fairly political lens, um, uh, much of which I, I don't share, but it can also be seen through uh, an academic lens, uh, much of which I do share, which is that there's an issue here needing to be uh, addressed, uh, which isn't being addressed, and it's, it's, it's on the margins. So the, the principal concern of post-colonialism, uh, which was itself for a long time, uh, and arguably still is, on the fringes of the discipline of, of IR, the principal concern was to attack um, the structural Eurocentric Orientalist um, assumptions that were embedded in IR that nobody was thinking about. This wasn't so much racism was part of this wider package of Eurocentrism and Orientalism, um, which it was all tangled up, if you like, in those things, not necessarily being um, the main element in them, but being one of the strands that, uh, that uh, compose these in, in varying degrees. So this confusion that I spoke of earlier on um, about uh, racism being part of a wider package of human inequalities that, that can include cultural uh, and political and economic differentiations and hierarchies. This, uh, in a sense, was the difficulty, was the problem faced uh, by uh, the post-colonialists. And of course, their target was much wider than, than IR. Now, in my view, um, there's quite a lot of merit in the charge that international relations is Eurocentric. Um, uh, I've been writing for a long time that uh, much of international relations theory can be sim seen simply as a kind of abstraction of Western history and Western uh, political theory. And even more narrow than that um, uh, is a very conspicuous dominance of the Anglosphere, of Britain, America, uh, and the other countries of the Anglosphere. Uh, they are very, very dominant in, in IR, which is uh, uh, why this talk is happening in English <laughs> rather than, uh, than some other language. So there has certainly been um, a, a very strong sense uh, in which uh, the whole discipline of international relations has confused Western history and the rise of the West with world history. And it seems the question in front of us now um, is how should international relations as a discipline respond to this, uh, uh, this question? So this uh, br uh, brings me uh, to the last part of my, of my talk of sort of what do we what do, we do um, at, at this point? Um, since I broadly agree with the post-colonial view that there is a problem here, um, that there's a lot of Eurocentrism with uh, some racism woven into it, within IR, how do, we, how do we respond to this? Uh, it seems to me that the first point is that international relations as a discipline needs to respond to this, and it needs to do so pretty urgently, because if it doesn't, uh, there's a real danger that uh, the attempt to produce a more global discipline of IR that takes into account uh, everybody's histories, that kind of uh, uh, IR that uh, Amitabh Acharya in particular has been writing and talking about uh, for, for many years. Um, this, uh, this project will be endangered uh, unless these issues are, are, are properly addressed with it. In some senses, one might see the discipline as, as being in the presence of a third founding moment uh, uh, after the ones in 1919 and 1945. It needs now to move from being um, a, a very West-centered or Eurocentric uh, discipline to being something that is properly globally centered. And this is more than passingly ironic in the sense that uh, if any discipline should be properly globally centered, it should be the discipline of international relations, which is after all the study of humankind as a whole and how it uh, how it organizes itself. Uh, so this really is uh, an existential issue for the discipline. It's absolutely clear uh, that the West needs to remember and acknowledge and confront you know, the colonial and racist elements of its uh, much of the global South uh, 
uh, uh, not to mention China, remembers all of this and remembers it uh, extremely well. So uh, China, for example, uh, is continuously talking about uh, the century of humiliation and the need, um, as it were, to respond to that. And uh, it, it, it keeps that memory uh, very vigorously alive. So these things are not going to go away. Time is not going to heal them. Um, they need to be uh, confronted and, and addressed. Now, that said, um, I think it's, it's, it's equally important to keep in mind that whilst racism is a big and important issue, um, it's not the only uh, big and important issue uh, in confronting the discipline of international relations. There are two, uh, other issues that are equally or more important, which is what the discipline uh, is supposed to be about. Um, war and peace, um, how to handle uh, environmental change, um, how to handle other forms of, of inequality, uh, sexual inequality, uh, most obviously, but also economic uh, inequality, uh, how to handle public health issues, how to handle migration issues. These are all issues that uh, might have some overlap with race in, in various ways, but um, diminishingly so, uh, um, I think, because increasingly race correlates much less um, with discrepancies in wealth, power, and cultural authority th than it used to do. Uh, decolonization uh, did actually mean something, and it, it did actually make a difference when you compare uh, the way things are now to the way that they were um, up until 1945. The change is pretty monumental. Um, so it's not as if things have been standing still. So there is a danger that um, uh, the race issue becomes, if you like, uh, too important um, uh, in IR, too political in IR, and begins to pull apart the ability of the discipline to deal with, with other questions. So um, I think, therefore, that the discipline faces um, some opportunities and some risks. Um, I, I don't think there's much danger of going back to the explicit kind of race theory that informed IR uh, before 1945. It's not impossible um, uh, if you think about the way in which race played into the rivalry between uh, the United States and Britain on the one hand and Japan on the other uh, in the decades before the Second World War. You could see how the current American uh, uh, and indeed increasingly Western rivalry with China could go down the same route. Um, I don't think that's going to happen. I think the idea of human equality as the basic principle is pretty strongly embedded everywhere, which isn't to say that there aren't racists and people whose practice belies that, but the, the general norm that seems to me to be pretty solid. My feeling is that there are two other dangers, uh, um, one which I've hinted at already. One is that uh, the, the discipline simply fails to deal with racism, that it, it blunders along in the way that it is now with, in other words, staying in its kind of West-centric, Eurocentric mode, not accommodating um, uh, the rising powers and peoples uh, and cultures uh, from the global south more broadly, and therefore containing the potential to fragment into uh, international or civilizational versions of international relations, um, all of which disagree with each other and, in a sense, then block the path to the development of a global IR. I think that's the danger on the one end. The danger on the other end is that the more radical end um, of, of anti-racism threatens to drop international relations discipline into, into kind of destructive culture wars, which don't help uh, anyway. Um, it's quite easy to be accused um, of, of racist practice if you cite people like Hobbes or Hannah Arendt um, or Carl Schmitt or pretty much anybody who wrote before 1945, because all of them were racists in one form or another, because that was the norm at the time. Right? So it, there's a danger in this kind of, of uh, hyperactive anti-racism that 
in a sense, it ends up saying you can't cite anything that was written before 1945 because if you do, you're reproducing racism. Now, <clears throat> to let everything before 1945 go <laughs> is kind of starting again, not just in international relations, but in the social sciences uh, and humanities as, as a whole. And I, I am unconvinced that this is a good idea. And I am worried um, that this kind of thinking is gaining a certain amount of traction uh, uh, in the more critical uh, wings of international relations. And that this could tip us into, as I say, uh, very unhelpful cultural wars, which would simply paralyze the discipline and stop it from doing what it needs to be doing uh, in relation to all of these other uh, important issues. So the opportunities, I think, um, for IR are, are, are two. I mean, it definitely needs to start by seeing world history as world history um, and not just Western global stories. Okay? Um, now, uh, quite a lot of progress is being made towards this, uh, and this is where a good uh, work in the kind of home stretch of my of my career uh, is, is orientated. I think we need to understand all of that a lot better than we do um, and to put it into a properly uh, uh, global context. And again, I'm happy to talk about that in, in, in Q&A. We also need to figure out how to handle that question, which is raised by the more critical um, anti-racist voices within the discipline. But how do we deal with the legacy of racism um, in the literature? and in the practice of, of IR. There's certainly a lot of it there, um, and it needs to be certainly uh, acknowledged, um, and a lot of thought needs to go into how we actually deal with this. Um, I think perhaps an interesting model might be the way the left has picked up the work of Carl Schmitt, in the sense Carl Schmitt was was uh, in kind of intellectual exile because of his association with the, with the Nazis. But this didn't stop um, a number of figures on the left from thinking that, well, actually this man had a lot of interesting things to liberalism um, and, about, uh, and about liberalism. Um, and that those things are interesting even though he was a Nazi. Okay? So this, there are, are perhaps some models for how we start, uh, we start to do this. Uh, but whatever, we need to do both of these things fast. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Professor Busan, for your very, very interesting presentation. Uh, as you said, this is a very current, uh, highly charged topic in which sometimes the personal and the professional mix up in a in, in strange manners in, and in a different way that they mix up when we talk about constructivism or English school or realism or things like that. Um, it, it's, it, it might be very easy, I guess, to, um, to depict Fukuyama's end of history as the, the triumph of white uh, people over non-white people, or we could understand Huntington's clash uh, between civilization as a clash between races, or understand in a realist narrative the rise of China against the decline in America as the clash between a white and a non-white superpower. So everything might become a race issue, as you said. Um, so if everything is about race, so nothing is about race. Right, I think that's the danger of of considering race as a as a, a present problem, which is embedded in every single issue regarding international affairs. So, how can we think about the teaching um, of race in a, in an IR course? If if we have to introduce race for for somebody who has not been dealing with race. In an, in an introductory course on international relations. What would be the best approach to understand race from a, a theoretical perspective, for instance? Um, uh, could, could you say, for instance, that uh, a post-colonial perspective or a decolonial perspective might serve as a good starting point to unpack the relation between race and world politics? 
Do you think English school has also many things to say on the relation between race and world politics? How yeah. would you start to, to, you know, to open a window into this very pressing problem? Yeah, it's a big, it's a big question. I mean, for me, I think um, the two broad answers would, would first of all be uh, that international relations needs to reestablish its links with uh, a more global or, or world history. Um, uh, that, uh, in a sense, there are an awful lot of assumptions about history that are simply built into international relations, which are uh, you know, deeply Eurocentric uh, assumptions, uh, uh, which have implications for, uh, for racism and may carry racism uh, with them. So for me, I think uh, the way to do this is to, uh, is, is to relearn one's history um, in a more properly global sense. Um, and I think also to, to carry this idea that the issue, for me at any rate, the, uh, I wouldn't organize a course in the way that you were saying. I would organize a course around the study of human inequality as a, as a social principle. Right? So in that sense, I would take an English school approach to it because it's, uh, as I said, and, and it may be a controversial point, I, I think... Uh, I think racism as such um, is actually rather recent. I mean, it doesn't become really prominent in either um, uh, IR theory or in, um, in the practice of IR. It doesn't become prominent until the 19th century. I mean, before that, other very, people are much more concerned about religion for the most part uh, uh, before that. Um, but they're certainly, they're certainly not concerned about, uh, about race. So I've learned a great deal in going back and looking at, uh, at, at all of that. Uh, and maybe I'm currently engaged in writing the necessary textbook for it. I, I don't know. I'm trying to do a kind of uh, world history in English school perspective, which looks at this institution of inequality and how pervasive it was um, and how racism became a part of it um, uh, in, in a sense, almost its culminating uh, part before that whole uh, uh, institution or that whole norm fell apart um, after 1945. Um, I mean, I think the post-colonialists, I'm not a post-colonialist. Um, uh, I have some sympathy with post-colonialism, uh, perhaps more than it has with me, I'm, uh, I'm not sure. But I think the post-colonialists have put their, they, they've identified an important um, taken with the, a lot of the political baggage that goes along with this, which uh, which I don't share, um, but I do think they've they've identified a really crucial problem that does need to be addressed, uh, and that they've been in a sense on the margins uh, uh, too long. Like like most IR theories on the margin, they have an impenetrable jargon of their own, which is a barrier to to entry to anybody who wants to uh, to get into that. So I'm happy to give post-colonials a lot of credit for having mm. done the groundwork of getting this, as it were, on the agenda. Um, for me, at any rate, uh, post-colonialism is not the way forward. It, it, it will be for some people, and, and that's fine. But going forward from here has to be a lot broader than post-colonialism. It needs to infuse all of the other theories as well. And they need to, you know, liberals and realists and, uh, uh, and others need to understand their own intellectual history and how, uh, how easily and, and, and fully they sold out to racism when racism was fashionable. Exactly. Um, today there is a lot of discussion on, on the future of the liberal international order whether it is under threat at the hands of Trump or at the hands of a, of a rise in China or at the hands of nationalists and populists around the world, right? But not much is being said on its relation with race. How could we view the, 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 this international liberal order from a race perspective? Do you think we could find something interesting to tell about that? Mm. Um, I certainly agree that the liberal international order is, is under threat. Um, and I think it's under threat uh, from two directions. Uh, 
um, it's under threat inside the West as a consequence. Um, so uh, it seems to me the, the vote for Brexit in my country uh, uh, in 2016 and the vote for Trump in the US in 2016 are as clear an expression uh, as you could possibly want um, of the crisis of liberalism in its Anglosphere heartlands, right? So that um, large chunks uh, of the population in those heartlands, the, the liberal heartlands, are now <coughs> questioning or rejecting liberalism uh, because in practice it produces too much inequality. Um, that inequality, okay, we're, we're back to my, uh, my concern here about the entanglement of racism in a, so it's very common to say that, uh, that liberalism uh, uh, has produced inequality, and, and that's often talked about in, in economic terms. But of course, if you look at economic terms and inequality, uh, <laughs> there's quite a, a strong set of, of race and racist issues in there, which the Black Lives Matter movement and, and others are, are bringing a, attention to. So you can't disentangle these things. It's, it's why it seems to me that this conversation needs to be framed in terms of the principle of inequality, right? um, and then looking at how uh, uh, racism fits into that, rather than being just about racism itself. Yes. I, mean, I think the other, uh, the other angle under which you know, the liberal international order is under threat um, is that, uh, you know, as we sit here, we are visibly and quickly moving into the post-Western era. Right? So, um, in terms of the distribution of wealth and power and cultural authority, all three of those things, right? Not just wealth and power, but all three of those things. The world is becoming much more, uh, much more plural. The rise of China is the most obvious sign of that, but certainly, and this means that the international society, if you will, is becoming more multicultural, it shares a certain substrate of modernity, but nonetheless, uh, the liberal teleology that everybody is going to have to become like uh, the United States, uh, this is you know, rapidly crumbling away. And we are faced with a more diverse world in which cultural and ethnic and racial differences are in play. And there is some correlation, uh, you know, as I suggested, um, although I think it nightmarish uh, as a possibility, but you know, if you if you imagine uh, an American Chinese rivalry going the same way that the uh, the rivalry between Japan and the Anglosphere went, I mean nothing was more racist than the Pacific War, <laughs> um, and then right afterwards, all of that ended. I mean that that's in a sense almost the most extreme case of this really sharp break that happened uh, after the Second World War, that all of the extremely intense racism between Japan and the United States was just forgotten. Um, so, but that kind of thing, that potentiality is there in this, the emergence of, uh, of a much more plural uh, post-Western world order, which is necessarily culturally and racially and, and ethnically more diverse. Yes. Can we, if we look at the, the IR field as a discipline, can we talk about a race term in IR or is it too soon to tell? Um, I don't think so. I mean, well, not for me at any rate, uh, but you know, I, I'm hardly the mainstream of the discipline at this point. I'm old and long retired. Um, but I think... Uh, it would be, for the reasons I gave, I think that would be a terrible mistake. I mean, that IR would either tear itself apart over this um, or it would end up uh, focusing far too much on this issue and not on um, all of the other issues which are equally or more important that are on its agenda. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, I mean, to put it in absolutely brutal terms, right? um, the race issue is not going to define the end of the world or not. Right? <laughs> but the environment or nuclear war or some other things might very well define the end of the world or at least the end uh, of, uh, of any kind of stable world, uh, world order. Mm -hmm. uh, so it does seem to me important not to lose sight of that. The race thing needs to be addressed very urgently. 
It doesn't want to become the core question of the discipline. Yes, yes. Well, that would be my opinion. What's your take? Um, if we look at the United States today, it's a, it's a very troubled society. It has become, it is becoming a very polarized society. And, and within that polarization, race is part of the problem as well, right? Um, tensions between the police and black communities in the US are nothing new. Um, why do you think Floyd's uh, death became a tipping point in the public conversation on racism? And not only in America, but also around the world. How do you see this domestic uh, issue America still faces regarding racism connects with America standing in the world uh, overall, right? Mm. What's your opinion? Okay. Uh, rather than expert on American politics, so uh, you have to hear my answer with that uh, caveat in, in mind. But, um, I mean, the United States is still um, an extremely influential society, okay? So in, in some senses, it, it is still the superpower. We all pay vastly more attention to American domestic politics and what goes on there than we do to anybody else's domestic politics. Um, and it, the media soaks this up and projects it out and, uh, uh, and all of that. So we get a very exaggerated view um, of the importance of America. And of course, uh, the Americans like that in some, uh, in some ways. Um, it's, but America, if you think about uh, America's history, it is a particularly extreme case um, in, in terms of racism as, as an issue, um, partly because um, it has this huge pretense to being the ultimate kind of liberal society. I know there are contradictions there with liberalism being a dirty word in, uh, to, to many American ears, but, but to outsiders, you know, America is the most liberal country in the world in terms of its general concerns and its attitude towards um, uh, you know, civil, uh, civil and human rights and towards economic issues and, and, and all of that. But at the same time, um, America was, you know, until pretty recently, uh, pretty much an apartheid society. I mean, when I, exactly. I, I grew up in Canada next door to uh, America, so I got some, uh, some sense of that and, and, and the, the kind of first round, if you like, of the racial equality politics in the, in the U.S. To, in okay, that... that Made some difference, but but the U.S. has this gigantic baggage about uh, racism that uh, is not shared in the same way by uh, by other societies, and it is not dealt at all well uh, with it. I mean, certainly things have uh, have improved, but you get you know one of the reasons why racism becomes a global issue is because America still gets a lot more media attention than anything else, and because this issue in America is particularly huge, um, and and not yet uh, a resolved one in uh, in American politics. And you know, add into that mix, um, you know, the global media, uh, social media, and all of that, where things can spread extremely quickly, and where a lot of people have um, either personal or political motives in in doing so. I mean, these kinds of uh, mass. Uh, uh, enthusiasms, mass frenzies, I don't know what you would uh, call them. These are a lot easier to produce than they, uh, than they used to be. Um, so mm -hmm. the kinds of, of uh, politics that is going on around race at the, at the moment are in some fundamental ways quite different um, to what was going on in the 1960s because the media that projects them is quite different. I mean, there are obviously some, uh, some similarities and these things are, are all part of a, of a longer social movement. But I do think, you know, the United States is not a normal country in this respect. And it has a bigger problem about racism than most other places do. Um, it has dealt with it um, in, in some ways fairly well, but in some ways not well at all. And particularly, uh, I mean, it's, it's moved in sense, if you, if you buy my idea of the spectrum of racism, the, the U.S. has... 
uh, to a considerable extent, moved away from the personal, in-your-face, very intense race. To but if you're on the wrong end of it, you know, it still kills you <laughs> in all kinds of ways, whether it's the police shooting you or you live in some rubbish, polluted neighborhood and you die 20 years before somebody living in a better neighborhood. Exactly, yeah. We, um, we have to, to close the, this session, but uh, let me uh, put forward my, the last question, which has to do with this in-your-face racism. Uh, and, and, and it touches a bit your personal side or the, your, the personal side of the equation, because you said, well, it might be the case that in-your-face racism is less prominent But in your face, accusations of being racist are on the rise within academia, right? Um, you develop with Oli Weaver um, uh, uh, the securitization theory, and suddenly, and, and out of the blue, um, uh, two scholars said securitization theory is a racist theory. I imagine your face reading that line for the first time, but could you tell us your first reaction to this kind of uh, observation dash accusation? How did you feel? Uh, yeah, okay. Um, uh, uh, the one thing to, to, to make clear is that the, uh, the accusation, uh, and this reflects an interesting structural issue in this whole question. Uh, the accusation was not against me and Ola as being racist. It was against securitization theory. Right? As a racist uh, theory, uh, right. So there was a specific disclaimer that we, you know, we're calling the work racist, but not the yes. people. Now, quite how you do that, how do you make that separation? Um, it certainly felt personal the first time we, we read it because you know, if it's racist and we wrote it, then we have some responsibility for that because, uh, exactly. because we wrote it. Um, okay. the, the, the second reaction, um, and one that I think is pretty widely shared, was that that article was such an appalling piece of scholarship um, that it, it didn't actually make the case. Um, uh, and, uh, and in that sense was irresponsible because it called for the closure of what has been, uh, by any measure, an extreme, um, a body of, of research around securitization theory that's been adopted by hundreds uh, of people within, uh, within the discipline and produced a lot of good work. So we were angry um, about that, that such shoddy scholarship should be um, connected to a call for the closure, uh, a complete closure of a whole uh, thought. And that gave us that anger gave us the motivation to do an extremely um, in-depth critique of, of their uh, of their work which anybody who's interested they can see the short version uh, on the security dialogue uh, uh, web website where they allowed us a short response uh, but there's a link there to a much longer response a book length response uh, indeed showing just um, how poorly made that argument was. So at the end of the day, we don't feel they made an argument at all. So we're not particularly concerned about, uh, about the critique that they made because it, does, it doesn't rest on anything. Right? It basically it rests on the assumption, which I, which I mentioned earlier, that in some sense, um, all of Western social science and, and humanities and everything, and anybody who cites anybody who wrote before 1945, it's all racist, right? Yeah. Now, to some extent, that's true, right? So then what thing and say, oh, well, you know, securitization theory is racist or liberalism is racist, it's all racist, right? So it doesn't, it doesn't do you any, uh, any service or, or, or any benefit to say this and that, And point and point fingers. The problem is how do you deal with the with the whole thing? It's a much bigger problem than that. So uh, I thought that um, that whole episode was um, extremely counterproductive for uh, the anti-racism uh, side of of critical IR theory because it did such a poor job of it, um, creating mm -hmm. you know a huge furore for nothing, basically. Um, mm. and not advancing that cause at all. Um, mm. So, if anything, my, my lingering 
sentiment about it is anger, anger at the poor scholarship. Yes, yes. It's uh, exhibit A on how not to do race studies. <laughs> 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 so it seemed to me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, Professor Bresson, it was so, such an honor to be here with you, to listen to you and to talk to you. So uh, we need to close the session and we hope to, to see you back again in, in this format or in, in the real life. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Pleasure to talk with you and nice to see you again. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. Bye -bye. Good luck getting this all together. <laughs> <risa> Thank you. Thank you. See you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bueno, empezamos con, con un plato fuerte en el Congreso. Eh, ahora tenerlo al, al teórico británico Barry Busan es todo un honor, eh, como ya habíamos dicho. Eh, gracias Federico Merke también por, por tu moderación, que fue muy buena. Bueno, nos dejan eh, algunas enseñanzas que tienen que ver sobre todo con tener una mirada amplia ¿sí? en relación al tema. Y no solamente enfocarnos el tema del racismo como un fenómeno estrictamente social, sino pensarlo de las relaciones internacionales, cómo los estados digamos, abordan el tema, cómo se generan políticas comparadas entre ellos. Sí, para nosotros los estudiantes es un honor tener a, a Busan, eh, que lo, tanto lo leemos en la carrera, eh, poder escucharlo en vivo es, es un placer y contar con la moderación de Federico Merque también. Bueno, así dimos comienzo a la primera conferencia de esta cuarta conferencia mundial de relaciones internacionales. Creo que eh, ha cumplido las expectativas y tenemos mucho por delante. Se vienen cuatro días de conferencia en total. Esperemos que estén junto a nosotros. Para nosotros fue un honor esta charla, poder haberla compartido con ustedes. Esperemos que sea de su agrado y que nos sigan acompañando estos tres días que nos quedan. Hoy un día extenso. Ahora, próximamente, luego de un break, el profesor John Eikenberry, que va a darnos también una exposición de primer nivel. Así que los esperamos a la brevedad. Hacemos un pequeño break y ya estamos con todos ustedes. <música>